Yeah, so, hello, nice to see all of you. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Fabian Deutsch, and I'm going to speak about KubeVirt, which is about running virtual machines on containers. I worked on Overt, which is a virtualization solution for a couple of years, and um, then we went over to work on KubeVirt, um, where people from Overt and OpenStack are working on, and I'm working at Red Hat, a Linux company doing Linux stuff. So. If we start, then we can say that virtualization is omnipresent today. Oh, the focus of this talk is obviously, or it was in the light um, of this track to say um, persistent migration. So how do we how do we get from today to to something in the future? And um, virtualization is omnipresent today. That means it's everywhere. Good morning. Um, so it's getting crowded. I think there's still a few places. Um, so virtualization is omnipresent today. That means you, you have virtual machines everywhere. You've got them classically in the data center where you've got your own virtual machines to run your Oracle database, or you've got them in the cloud, in GCE, in Amazon, in Azure, where you can create gazillions of instances with the snip of a finger. Um, but in this case, it's really about, about you or about us. How do we get our virtual machines over to um, to the present day. And it's not, I mean, today we just don't have virtual ma machines anymore, but we also have containers. They came up in the recent years, and I guess that you all know containers. So who of you has used containers before? Ah, nice. And who of you has used virtual machines before? Oh, that's perfect. There you go. So um, containers are here as well. And the question is, um, if we look at them, and, and we look at them and we see them and we see all the hypes and we see how much is done with containers, they're so fancy tools with so fancy names and, and they look and taste and smell a little bit like, like virtual machines, and, um, but just better because it's new and it's hyped, it's, it can do everything. You won't have any bugs um, and, and then you do get to the point where you, where you ask yourself, um, how can I replace my VMs with containers? There are several reasons for that. I mean, efficiency is one obvious point. You can say that more containers fit on a host than VMs do. Um, they are quicker to launch and eventually easier to manage because they are text-driven. You have a Docker file and you can write in there whatever you want and you just rebuild the image if you want a new version. So that's really handy. In VMs, you need bigger provisioning tools. You, know, you use Ansible or Salt or templates in OpenStack. So containers are, and we need to grant that, are, are really easy to handle. Um, and so at some point, you might, oh, who has asked himself if you can replace your VM with a container? OK, at least a few. Um, why didn't you ask yourself why you want to replace them? Ah, you want to start from scratch, yeah. Trying to build everything separate and new and shiny. Yeah, starting from scratch. And like a new car. You don't want to take your old car and give it your paint. Um, yeah, so I think we're good on time, so we can make a little next course. So the thing is, if we speak about replacement, then we need to ask ourselves, can they really substitute each other? So can containers actually replace VMs? And um, as said, you look at them and they look the same. You can do similar stuff. Oh, the management tools around them are also pretty similar. So you've got Kubernetes and there's Docker Swarm. And I, I read one of these new tools from SUSE. What was it called? I don't know, Lighthouse or something like that. So there are a range of tools which, which help you managing containers and also around the whole life cycle. So there's really a lot of stuff around containers. Um, but then if you look in the detail, what technology is used, what impacts does it have um, for your application. I mean, in the end, we don't run VMs for fun or containers for fun. We run them because we want to deliver an application to users. So we run a VM with a database to give an admin the database he needs, or we run a VM to give a user um, a desktop on demand. So there's a reason why we do it. And um, so what, why I'm saying that is because um, we run them and we need to see if they, yeah, if we can replace them. So 
we need to take a look at the technology and see, t see if, if containers can give us the same as VMs. So for example, if we speak about desktop, which in a university, for example, an admin is providing to users on demand, like for, I don't know, for doing a course or a class or programming um, task or so, um, they might use a remote, des remote desktop solution and that's just not available in containers. So they can do, obviously, a serial console or so, but it's things you need to be aware of. Or if you got in a, in a, in a hospital, they use remote desktop solutions to, to have their specific application for handing, I don't know, scans or so remotely sometimes, and use smart cards for authentication. So in, in these classical virtualization world, you've got the features to do um, pass through of the smart card from your thin terminal to the server, but it's not there yet in the container world. Um, but on the other hand, containers provide different features. Containers are easy to scale, so if we look at Kubernetes, you've got the possibility to take one container and scale it up to hundreds, um, which is not so easy with, with VMs on the other side. So there are technical differences, even if they look and feel the same, and if they really fit into your use case, um, that really depends on the application you are supporting for your users. So if you can replace a VM with a container, it really depends. It depends on the use case you have. OK, so in case you can replace um, a container with your VM, your, uh, a VM with a container, you're all good. So um, it might be a Java application which you can put into a container, and it's really simple. You don't have to do anything. Uh, well, a year later, you're you know that you have to do some stuff to really make it efficient and, and fit your application to a container. So it's not easy. Um, but I want to focus more on the case where you can say, no, I cannot replace my VM with a container because of certain constraints. I mean, today, the virtualization world is there for, I don't know, 20 years or so in different stages. And the applications we have evolved, and they grew in that system. So you have big monolith lists which are optimized to run in a VM. They make assumptions about the operating system, about how you deploy stuff. So everything we as admins or we as developers did in the last years was, was built on these assumptions we have for virtual machines. Like, a lot of tools have, have UIs. So there is the expectation that you have a screen to display that UI. And you don't, have, you don't meet that requirement in the container world where you just have, well, you can say it takes UI as a UI as well. I'm speaking about really GUI applications. And surely you can take your application and change it to, to meet the container technology, but it takes time to change an application. If we think about complex applications, I don't know, for big business processes, you need to change them. You need to adopt them. And so you might say, I cannot replace my VM right now with a container, but I want to do that um, in the future, when my application is ready for that. <laughs> Good. So now regardless if you want to start now or if you want to start in future, at least we're here because we say we see the transition is happening. We see we are in the VM world today and we want to get started with containers in production. Really, I mean, seriously, we want to get started. So the question is, do we start from scratch with shiny new things and everything works? Um, I think if you look at the containers themselves, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, you want to build up your container infrastructure from scratch and, and look at it. But if you look at the application, are you using um, virtual machines in production? OK. So would you say the application you provide to your customers or to your users, you would start that application from scratch? So you would rewrite it to, to fit into the container world? No. Yeah. That's quite a lot of work. So I think. The infrastructure will be started from scratch to host containers, but the application yourself, that is not something you want to rewrite. So we need to see how can we, I mean, we do, we provide our application to customers because we make money, and um, hopefully. And um, we don't want to rewrite that just for the reason of moving to a new infrastructure. So in reality, we need to find a way how we can gracefully move over. How we, we are here, that is a fact. And we need to provide and continue to provide our product to customers or to users. And the question is, how can we still do that? How can we keep providing that application to users, even if we move our infrastructure, for example, in the direction of containers because of the benefits they have? 
and they support different development models. I mean, agile is a big word in that world, and DevOps, and oh, there are so many cool words. Uh, words, yeah. So it's not it's not that we want to write our application from scratch, but we rather want to see that we support an evolution, so that we take our application and gracefully move it into the direction to be able to run containers. So we want to evolve it. So how can we do that? And that is that is slowly the point where I want to get at with this presentation is how can we support the transition from the classic data center and cloud world today with the classic application with the legacy you can call it legacy applications we have today and into that new world where you have decomposed applications microservices running on service meshes and you can find another or more buzzwords here as well so the classical stack very simplistic, is that you have your infrastructure, your bare metal infrastructure, so you've got your storage, I don't know, XAN or NAS, dedicated, you've got your network switches, and you've got, obviously, you've got your physical hosts, and they are aggregated into some kind of management plane, so you've got your virtual machine management application, VMware, Overt, OpenStack, there are many others, just to name a few, um, and, and on top of them, you've got your virtual machines running, which you need to keep running. And I'm continuing to highlight that because we, I mean, I'm paid by Red Hat, and we live in the reality that we need to see how we can really support our customers, and that is really what is driving us. How can we get them from today into the future? We need to give them enablement, and we want to support them in that. So that is where we are today. And then we say, okay, let's start from scratch and bring up our new management plane, which is optimized for containers. So we need storage again, we need network again, we need service again, and then we'll have a management plane dedicated to containers. Yeah, and you see that on the right side with the blue box. Um, but that means you have twice the infrastructure. Depending on what your setup is, you need to dedicate your storage device to this container use case, and you need to dedicate a network, an overlay network, whatever, to that container use case. Um, so, you, I mean, if you want to start, if you want to POC something, if you want to get a feeling for it, that's totally fine. But we speak about really the serious migration after that. You see containers work for me and somehow I need some time to migrate my stuff, but that works then. In that case, you probably don't want to maintain two production grade um, infrastructure parts in your company. Actually, before we, you actually want to maintain a single one. You want to back up a single ZAN or NAS and you want to make sure that the a single instead of switches are running, and that you don't have to um, double everything. Actually, there's another th setup what you could do. You could say, I take my existing virtual machine setup, and on top of that, I build my um, container management plane. So everything above the orange box is then virtualized. But the problem here is um, that you still have two infrastructure layers because you've got the real one at the bottom and the middle one where you need to provide virtual storage. So you need to have a VM which is serving storage and um, networking is not so problematic but you still need to manage it in the virtual machines. So you still have an overhead because you have got two different layers where you need to provide infrastructure either for virtual machines or for containers. So it's not, I think it's good for the POC case and people do that very often. Who did that? Who used virtual machines to play with containers? Ah, oh, yeah, very good. That's good for the statistics. So, um, yeah, it's very convenient. And I agree, but again, in, in practice, it's then um, you still have to maintain two, two infrastructures. So, and that's where we get to Qbert. So Qbert tries to exactly go into that area. So Qbert provides you the ability to run containers and virtual machines on the same infrastructure. So you don't have to provide two different, two distinct set of of, of, um, of components for storage network and, and just physical hosts, all the stuff you need. Eventually, two, two data centers or two rooms physically depends really on what you want to provide to your customers. So how does it look? It's simple. So Qbert allows you to use the same management plane and to use the same physical storage and network, virtual storage and network and other components you have in your, in your, in your setup. Um, and the management plane in this case is, is Kubernetes. But why is it better or why is it good in our opinion? It's because it allows you, I mean, 
the orange box is so large because we have the assumption that today you have many virtual machines and you start to play with containers. But over time, you want to move stuff over where it makes sense. So we said some applications can be moved faster than others depending on their requirements. Some might not be able to, to be moved ever. If we think about security aspects, if somebody in the room is working with security, you might know that you need VMs to have real complete OS isolation. I don't want to go into the container details, but um, containers have these, yeah, they, they effectively share the kernel, kernel as you all know, um, and VMs provide the ability to, to not share the kernel, but have your own kernel per VM, which is good if you want to do, I don't know, some testing on that kernel. Oh, for, oh, yeah, testing is, is a good example. If you want different architectures, then you, on a single host, then you still want to have VMs because containers is not, um, is not the component which can give you that. So, yeah. So you can slowly move in this slide. You've moved more, more stuff from the virtual machine side to the container side. And the good thing is, the distortion network is not twice there in the picture. In reality, that really helps admins to keep the oversight over their components. Um, yeah, and in the end, um, it doesn't look much different um, as said. You might want to keep some VMs where it doesn't make sense to, to move to containers. Whenever you've got questions, interrupt me. I think we've got enough time. Um, regardless, um, now that we've looked at this overview, why, why we want to have Qbert, because we look at it from the reality standpoint, you cannot build everything from scratch again, because it's all money, it's all time you need to invest. So we wanted to see how we can provide a migration path for your application. So, um, let's take a look a little bit, um, um, a, a close look at how, how this looks technically. So this was pretty high level so far and I want to get a little bit more into detail. Um, so Kubernetes is the management plane we built upon, um, which is classically the um, um, a framework to run containers on a, on a cluster, on a number of hosts. But it doesn't provide the ability to run virtual machines. There are different projects. I mean, we have Kubert. Kubert is the very best here, by far. <laughs> no, but we've got other projects like Vertlet and Rancher, and they try something similar. So they also run virtual machines on, on Kubernetes, but with a different focus. And I'll get to that in a minute. So in very simple pictures, if you now add Kubert to the picture, then you're able to run virtual machines. Um, all right. So, and that's actually a slide missing. I should have added that. So, why is Kubert different than, for example, Vertlet or Rancher? Oh, who has he heard of Vertlet or Rancher or Clear Containers? Rancher. Rancher, great. Rancher. Ah, really, really interesting to see. I think Rancher is the project which is closest to um, to Kubert, by the way, um, and. The difference to Rancher, because it seems to be <laughs> common sense here, um, is, no, not, not a difference to Rancher, but in general, our take is that we want to express VMs as they are. So if you look at VMs and at containers, or if you looked into one of the Kubernetes introductions, then if you look at the difference between VMs and pods, you see that they have different properties, and we spoke about that. So you can, VMs can have architectures, pods don't have that. It's implicitly dictated by the architecture you have below. <coughs> VMs have, can have Gesundheit, multiple displays. Um, pods don't have that. Graphical display at all is not something what, what pods have. Um, multiple networks, physical different devices, if you want to test device drivers or do device pass through, that is not something you can simulate in a pod. You can for sure provide a network interface to, to a pod, but it's, not devi devi it's a network device, but it's not, not it's not ri driven by a real driver. It's not, you know, you, you, yeah, that's, now I got into those details which are difficult to explain. Um, so you don't really have device drivers for that. For example, if we look at the VTHs and the kernel, they are not physical devices. They are concepts inside the kernel to, to connect um, containers to, to the host namespace. Um, why I'm saying that? Because we think that there are enough differences between pods and virtual machines that VMs need their own definition. So if no mistaken, and please correct me, it 
has been some time, at least Vertlet um, is one of the approaches which is running VMs with Kubernetes, but they implicitly derive the VM from the pod specification. So there, for example, it's, they have some workarounds. They use annotations to, number, to specify the number of CPUs, but if you want to reuse a specific disk, oh, they use the volumes of pods to, to attach disks, but setting displays, adding USB devices, that's not possible because they derive it from the pod spec. And Clear Containers is doing the same. So they look at the pod and derive a VM from the, from the pod spec. But as said, the pod spec does not provide enough details um, to, um, to, to, to define any VM you can have. If we look at certain operating systems from Microsoft, like Windows, um, then it's a fact that you need to have a stable hardware ABI over time. So your devices should not change, otherwise you're asked to re-register or re-authenticate. I, I don't actually know the name of the process, but you need to call Microsoft to get your oh, activate to activate your Windows again if the hardware devices change. So we would really like to keep these VM API or ABI stable over time. With the Rancher or Vertlet approach, yeah, even with Rancher. With the Rancher, Vertlet and Clear Contains approach, it's not possible. If you do updates and QMO changes below, the ABI will change. Depending how often that happens, you need to activate it at some point. So we said we want to expose the VM ABI, so the virtual hardware, completely as an entity in Kubernetes. And that's, that's an important, that is the difference between Kubernetes and other solutions. Um, so if you look at the VM ABI in Kubernetes, then you will see, we can actually do that, that you can express um, really the VM details. And that is necessary to keep that VM ABI stable over time. Who's familiar with Libvirt? Eventually, that's good. So Libvirt is that such a component which has been around in the virtualization area of Linux for a long time. And um, we use it internally. And that is why the um, VM definition looks a little bit similar to the DOM XML if you have looked at, at Libvirt. And here you also see, and that's actually the first bullet uh, on that slide is, uh, or the second bullet, that we have a new resource type for VMs. That is what you just saw. So we have a specific dedicated VM type where you can specify many details. So it will take some time until we cover all the details because there are problems in the details. Oh, if you think about performance, a very good example. Um, VMs are often tuned for performance and um, then you get to funny things like NUMA, where you need to make sure that certain virtual processes are tied to the right physical processors. And if you do device path through, that the device is really aligned with the device node of the virtual CPU. And that is stuff Kubernetes does not care about yet. They are working on it, but we need the tight control over it. Because we speak about series VMs, we really want to provide production-ready VMs, which you can use and support over, over time. And so what we can do is we can use this extensive VM API I, I, I just chew, uh, I've just shown to, to, to pin CPUs to, to certain physical CPUs. Right, so I spoke about the API. Um, one thing is that we want, and I'll go to the first bullet, is that we provide everything in pods. And why do we do that? Um, if you look at Vertlet, Rancher, Clear Containers, take all three of them, Currently, you cannot run it on any Kubernetes cluster because it makes assumptions about the hosts below. So you need to install, in, ver in the Vertlet case, it assumes that QMO is around. It assumes that the relevant kernel modules are around. So that is stuff which, if we look at Kubernetes, it's all about the cluster. You usually don't care about what operating system is below Kubernetes because you can run Kubernetes on Debian, Linux, um, yeah, on Debian, Linux, on Fedora, on SUSE, CoreOS, whatever, and you usually don't care what is below. You, I, want to, I have my container and I want to run it on the, on the cluster, so the new platform is the cluster and not the host anymore, which is good. But in these existing solutions, what we identified as a problem is that they do rely on the underlying host, and that limits where you can run the solution. So we try to provide all the dependencies and pods, so that you can deploy Kubert like any application on Kubernetes. You don't have to provide anything else. Actually, we, we try to be that good that we 
connect as a Kubernetes add-on so that you've got namespace awareness and that you integrate with, with the networking concepts, that you recognize the network policies and all that kind of stuff. We try to be a good citizen as well by being, by being based on an operator pattern. That's in a pattern introduced by CoreOS. And I just, um, the important part, important part here is that we try to behave. So even if we are virtualization and virtualization conflicts with containers in certain fields, but um, we still try to behave nicely on the cluster. So we also want to be declarative, like you can declare pods or the state of pods, and we want, and we follow this pattern by imp uh, implementing the operator pattern. Um, so the last bullet point here is VMs live inside pods. It's, on the one side, it's an implementation detail, but often it does, people do care about it, so that's why I named it. So VMs are not pods in, in our implementation, but VMs live in the resource group of a pod. What's the difference and why does it matter anyway? So we had the ability to say that we run, and it might come at some point, but it doesn't, it's not so important yet. So if we run pods, um, Kuber the only unit Kubernetes is aware of in the, in the case of, of a specific workload is a, is a pod. All other concepts are built on pods, so our higher level concepts to pods. And what we said is all right, so Kubernetes tracks pods, so we want to see especially tracks resource usage and it um, applies limits to pods. So what we needed to make sure is that we really, um, that on the one hand Kubernetes is able to track VMs the same way, way. So that is why we place them in pods. But you could still say, well, but why don't you, for example, implement VMs in Kubernetes? Um, and that is where we, we get to, to these conflicts again. If we implemented VMs really inside Kubernetes, then we have the problem that certain functionality is just not there in Kubernetes because it doesn't fit with those concepts. For example, if we think about live migration, who used VM live migration in practice? A few people. It's very convenient because you don't have to bring down and call your customer and say, yeah, it will be back in 20 minutes, but you migrate your VM and it often works. We had a lot of time to optimize that process, but it's not there in the container world. You can implement that. I, I wonder how good it will become, um, but it's conceptually not something you have with containers. Containers are stateless. You, how, how was it called yesterday? They're mortal. So they can go away and you just reinstantiate a new one. And that is not something you want to do with production VMs of legacy applications. You want to keep them around. That is why we live migrate them. So we want to have live migration but we knew that we cannot bring it into Kubernetes because it clashes with the concepts of, cont of containers. Um, so that is why we say that whole VM logic is atop Kubernetes. It's a layer atop Kubernetes and it's leveraging the concepts of Kubernetes. And that's why we use pods. We see a pod as a harbor for a VM. So you bring a pod and, that, and that's where we place the VM. And if we do a migration, we just create a new pod, then we move the VM from one pod to the other. And Kubernetes can kill it afterwards. So the state of the VM is really not, not tied to a pod, which is good, because that is how, how Kubernetes handles pods and containers. But we can still deliver our functionality of, of doing the live migration, because we just see them as, as resource constraints or resource containers for VMs. If I'm getting too technical or too detailed, please let me know. Or if you've got questions, also let me know. All right, so we looked at the VM API, that's good, and because we're getting oh, already to the end, I think we're scheduled for 45 minutes, um, we can get our hands on, and I hope it works, I'm confident it does. So, um, has anybody tried Minikube before? Oh, that's cool, for all the people who didn't lift the hand, I would really recommend it. Minikube is so nice to try, and if you want to get your hands up with Kubernetes, Give Minikube a try. It's really, it's like, oh, just Google Minikube or Bing Minikube or um, DuckDuckGo Minikube, you will find it. Um, so the demo I'm going to show, maybe we can still switch again, is based on Minikube. Um, I'm using the VM driver KVM, which is just important because it's Fedora and it's Linux and you can have different drivers. Important is to use uh, the network plugin CNI. And you can actually clone that demo, and I hope it works for you as well. Um, 
the slides will be public later on if, in case you really want to give it a try. Um, so, what I'm doing now is um, that will be, will be quite some output. So what the demo does, it, it clones Qbert from GitHub, so we are all public, it's nothing secret even if we do it as a company or, um, or so, it's all public, we have all the issues there, you're welcome to contribute, welcome to try, welcome to file issues, welcome to fix them. Um, so what happened is we cloned that repository and used the manifest, so we provide all kinds of manifests. So here we see um, we've got a vert controller and we've got um, a VM resource. So the VM resource is, is our own VM definition, the API we saw before. The controller is related to the operator pattern. So it's watching for new VM definitions and then acting upon them. We've got the handler, which is a daemon set, and we're deciding on every node and making sure that if a VM is getting scheduled to a specific host, that we, um, that we really launch a VM if it's getting scheduled to a specific host. Um, and all these components were now um, deployed on Minikube. If you do it for the first time, it can take, depending on your internet connection, some time because images are pulled down and it's still early phase, so the images are quite large. It will get better over time. Um, so if we look what kind of pods are running now, oh, that's too large. Yeah, that's better. Oh, we see that we've got a few components running. So we've got HA proxy. If anybody wants why HA proxy, then lift your hand, but we can ignore it. Um, we've got an ice card demo target because we, I'll get to that in a minute. We've got libvirt spice proxy to give the graphical console access from outside the cluster, vert API, um, the vert controller, I explained that the launcher test VM is actually, that is the pod which I said, which is launched to provide the resource container for the VM. And we've got the vert manifest, uh, yeah, which we want to get rid of, or maybe not, let's see. Um, so these are really components and it's a stock Minikube um, deployment. So what can we do now? Um, we looked at the pods and what we can do, oh yeah, we can take a look at the Libert container, for example. Um, to just confirm that we really have a VM running. And that's really nice if it works. So um, here you see, so what I did is, so we've got the vert, uh, the vert launcher test VM. And that was scheduled on a specific host where this pod for opening the resource group for that VM was launched, the handler saw it and told Libvirt to spawn a VM based on the VM API, which is also declared. Actually, let's take a look at the VM API. Oh yeah, oh that's nice. Because we've got our own um, type in Kubernetes, uh, we can actually use the whole kubectl tools to, to retrieve these commands. And actually, the goal of Kubert is we want to be friendly citizens and we want to work with Kubernetes. So, you know, today kubectl is pretty much tuned to what the Kubernetes case. So, so it has all the verbs to work with containers, but it doesn't support live migration, for example. So we want to work with the Kubernetes guys. We are actually providing our input there to make sure that, for example, in this kubectl case, we can add our own verbs. And if you're tracking the Kubernetes progress, then you might have seen that Kubernetes or kubectl now, I think one seven or one eight is supporting binary plugins on the hosts. So you, we now have the ability to provide our add-on to kubectl to then provide verbs which are relevant to virtualization. So we can have our verb k uh, kubectl live migrate and the VM name, for example. Um, yeah, 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 that's about Sophia. So and here, see, that is really the VM definition as, as it was shown on the slides. And that is used to bring up the um, VM on the host. And if you look above, it has all, you know, it, it has the feeling of Kubernetes, even if you can express the, all the VM requirements. You can work with labels, you can work with taints and tolerations. Um, so you can really leverage the infrastructure. A word on the infrastructure. So we started with that on the first slides. We said, Containers and virtual machines, if you want to run them today in production, you need separate infrastructure basements for both. In Kubert, it's not really used in this demo. I actually should update that. Um, 
if we look here, we see that um, so this little this little section says um, that we add a disk to the VM, but it's not using a persistent volume from Kubernetes in this case, but rather directly an iSCSI device or an iSCSI target. But what we work on, and it's actually merged, so I should update this, that you can use regular persistent volumes of Kubernetes instead of for, for pods, you can use them for VMs. There are certain constraints. So virtual machines uh, don't support file systems at disks. You need a raw block device or, or a device which is providing raw block device like semantics. And um, so we work with Kubernetes. We actually um, now have in Kubernetes 1.8 the first raw block device support and we try to engage them. You know, we try to really get it into Kubernetes on the long run that we have stable support over time. And you can use PVs with, with the VM spec, so instead of referencing an iSCSI device, you can use a PV like you could use it for pods. So, and the semantics about exclusive or the access modes, multiple reader, multiple writer are, are recognized. What we're currently working on, because that the second part, large infrastructure part, is networking. And that's actually more tricky than storage. And we're also working here or collaborating with, with different parts to see that we get networking for VMs aligned with the infrastructure of Kubernetes. Uh, what does it mean? We just want to connect in a simple way VMs to the same networks as Kubernetes is using. It's more complicated than it sounds at the beginning. All right, so uh, the demo is running. Uh, we showed the VMs, we showed that it was running. If you follow the complete demo, then you can download a binary tool, and then you can do stuff like... Um, uh, what's it? Keyboard demo? Yeah, and then keyboard. Uh, cluster kubectl. Um, then you can do stuff like console test VM. The issue is that we lately moved to a new binary tool, which is a pre-stage to having that add-on for kubectl, which I did not install yet and where you can then directly access the console. And you can even say uh, kubectl spice. Oh. Spice test VM to then open a um, spice window. Yeah. All right. Um, then we can move back to the slides. <coughs> and that's quick. But yes, it was the last part. The demo is often good to put at the end because you never know if it works. So. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much so far. Other questions? Very good, yeah. Yeah, you said networking is a problem. Uh, could you explain why? Because uh, what I understand is usually you have some sort of CLI bridge on your host and you can just attach a VM to the host. That's yeah. Anything that's that's so the question was, what is the problem with networking? And the problem with networking is conceptual. So, so many problems with Kubernetes and VMs are conceptual. So. What you get in a pod is not an, you get an interface, but that's just implicitly what a pod is getting, and the core concept is that every pod has an IP. So Kubernetes is dictating that the pod is getting an IP. But in the virtualization world, you don't give an IP to the VM. I mean, you will, might do it if you have a DHCP server on your LAN, but you effectively give it an interface, so layer two connectivity. And so we need to say how we can, so we've got, Actually, uh, a colleague of mine is implementing now layer three connectivity for VMs so that we can really play nice with stock Kubernetes networking. But the core problem is we need to address is we want to give VMs the ability, like in our classical data center today, to choose their own IP and just provide them the layer two networking where they live on. Yeah, you could say, we, we could actually say, um, we don't want to do that. We just want to keep it the Kubernetes way and manage the IPs for them, so to do IP address management. Um, but we know that it takes time until legacy application support of living with the fact that they now get an IP and that they cannot dictate it anymore. So, but our first step is playing nice and we're close to get there and that will work with CNI. So we, will re we are requesting new interfaces for us from CNI for each NIC, for each virtual NIC we assign to a VM. That's currently work in progress. And I'm happy to show it next year or at KubeCon, let's see. Any more questions to that or? Okay, thanks. The man in blue behind you. Yes. Uh, do you think it's a really worth the effort to move all the VMs to a new platform for having in mind that it's going to be dead in a few years? Oh. Like you have all the, all the infrastructure like the Ember and Libre and uh, you have the administrators who are familiar with all the tools and everything. And so you really want to call to a new infrastructure? Well, you already know it's going to be done. 
So the question was, why do we invest anyway if, if VMs are going to die? That's a good question. We should probably stop now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I think the assumption is that um, VMs don't die so quickly. And we just, even if it's quite some effort, after all, it's not so much. It's actually pretty nice. It's a technical challenge, so it really is fun working on that. Thank you. We've got five minutes left. Um, but we need, if, I think it's worth the effort because it really takes time. And sometimes it takes more, it, we all know it often takes more time than you estimated at the beginning. So we know it will take time. And if we look at how many, you know, a lot of companies still get money from moving stuff from Unix to Linux. And Unix is pretty old. So we know that transitions take, take time. And we want to provide a solution for this transition path. But we don't want to have you being stuck with the infrastructure. I think companies will, will eventually stop supporting old infrastructure. I don't know if VMware now really goes up in just supporting containers. What do you do with vSphere? vSphere, vSphere is not seeing any updates anymore. And that's why we say, you still need to run your VMs, but you also need to be up to date to have security updates and that kind of stuff. So we say it's worth the effort to say, we allow you to move the VMs to the new infrastructure, but keep your classic VMs running until you are ready. And um, eventually, and there are reasons often again where, where you see that VMs are needed. Like for, for relief, if you want to do testing on a certain architectures, CI is such a big thing and it, does, it works for on the application level for with containers, but on the lower levels it just doesn't. And there's, that is what we know that VMs will stick around. Also for certain isolation techniques, we know that the isolation of containers because of the single kernel approach, some say it's not as good, some say it's sufficient, but regardless of that discussion, there are regulations which require to have a strong virtual machine isolation. Eventually these regulations will see an update as well, but so far they haven't. And in these cases, to meet regulations of governmental regulations, you need to run VMs. So, and, and the question is open if really VMs will, will die or not, to me. Yeah, sorry, there are um, pet packs to isolate um, desktop applications. I think we are sandboxing. I'm wondering what would be the um, or the better way of running desktop applications as a container instead of the flat pack. Oh, flat pack is a container runtime. Right. Yeah, so uh, what was the question? Um, can't. Flatback is, is. Who knows Flatback? Oh, if you've got too much time, take a look in Flatback. We really need to give it some power, give it some love. Um, so Flatback is, um, is a user friendly or for users a container format, no, not a container format. It's a container runtime targeted for unprivileged users. So you don't need root access to run containers. And the question was, why can't we reuse classical containers to run applications? Why should we use Platpak? And I think it's, after all, it's the same. <laughs> uh, technically, they also use C groups, they also use namespaces. They use user namespaces, that's why they can run unprivileged, which is an important characteristic. But image-wise, they are very similar. They might use different techniques on the low level, but the core concept, it's a container. They ship dependencies in a container, so to me, it's not so much different. Or was there something I missed in yeah, the yeah. question? I uh, understood that uh, we would then need VMs to run as an application in certain situations oh. uh, because you couldn't use containers. Oh. And I was wondering whether or not that pack would be something that would solve. Ah, OK. So the question was, and I did it, got it wrong, sorry. Um, the question is, why can't we use flat pack to run desktop applications? It's difficult to run Flatpak, uh, Windows applications in Flatpak if Wine doesn't support it. Um, and it's difficult to run a PowerPC or Power8, Power9 application in Flatpak if you've got an x68-64 host. And that is where, where VMs again come into the game. So we said that initially in the talk, why, what are the differences between VMs and containers? And it's like, there are so, it really depends on the application. If it's like Tmux, I would say, all right, you don't need a VM for Tmux, you can use Flatpak. If you run Calc, or a cal, the calendar application on the terminal, you can use Flatpak. But if you use, oh, even if you use GNOME, if you use GNOME Calculator, you can use, you can use Flatpak. It's, you know, it's, you can get it for the arc, uh, architecture you want, and it's Linux-based, that's not a problem. But if you really get to the details, you want to have 
when you have a graphical application which requires, oh well, uh, let me, it depends on the requirements of the application. If you need remote support, what kind of strong isolation you need, um, if you need a different kernel because of different architecture or different features, those, those, those questions play into the decision. Actually, we had a diagram early on where it said, it, it depends, you can port some applications directly con to containers, but often legacy applications which have grown over years, you cannot directly move them containers. You need a transitioning period to adopt the applications. Um, I hope I got it better now. Okay, sure. Anything else? Who of you will now try KubeWord? That's good. Any more hands? I, I would like to see more. <laughs> no, very good. If you've got any questions, get us on IRC. Oh, I missed to put IRC there. Twitter, GitHub, file us, contact us. We're all friendly, we're all humans, so happy to see you there, and thank you very much for your time, and good morning.